هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجبنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This has been a, a very difficult week for me and I'll start off by telling you why you know, one of the worst things that you can do to ruin someone's fun or to ruin a gathering or to ruin a party is to start talking about death. That's the worst thing you can do. It ruins the mood for everyone. And I was with my kids this past Saturday. We were sitting at uh, the McDonald's playroom, you know, where the kids can like go on the slides and they have like all these balls and things that they can play with. And I'm sitting there and I'm reading the newspaper and I get to the section of the obituary where it tells and announces all the people that have passed away. And as I'm reading this, I'm looking at the dates. And subhanAllah, the vast majority of people were born between 1930 and 1934. I would say 90% of the people that died were born between these years. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, logically speaking, that means that whoever was born in 1936, you know, Allah knows best, but it's very possible that they could be next on this list within the next two years. Now, the reason why 1936 is important to me is because that was the year my father, you know, Hafizahullah Ta'ala was born. And being away from my parents is always you know, an emotional struggle. Who's going to take care of them? What's going to happen if something you know, happens to them? La qadar Allah. And you know, what's going to happen in that situation? And I was with my kids, and I'm like, my wife's like, you know, why are you so down and stuff? And I'm like, it's nothing, don't worry about it. And she's getting upset, you know, why am I not talking about what's on my mind? But I don't want to ruin it for the kids. You know, you start talking to kids in the playroom about death, you know, you can imagine what's going to happen in that room. So time goes on. I didn't think too much of it. And we get to yesterday. And yesterday I remember waking up and just you know, opening my emails. I have something like maybe about 14 emails saying that someone has passed away. And I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, who could have passed away? And I looked through it and it's one of my colleagues from the Islamic University of Medina. His name was Arif Saeed. And this brother, he was forced out of his country, Suriname. He used to live in Suriname, and he, he migrated to, to Indonesia. And they accepted him there, and you know, that's where he lived. And we studied together at the university all, all the way up until 2008. Now the thing about this brother, I'm sure we've all met people like this in our lives, but people who are annoyingly happy. Meaning that the world could be ending and this brother smiling at your face as if nothing is wrong. He was one of those brothers. SubhanAllah. And you know, when I heard about his death, I couldn't believe it. Because he was 30 years old, 30 years old. And the way he died was he prayed Salat al Dhuhr. Um, he used to teach at the university, prayed Salat al Dhuhr, and was on his way home. And on his way home, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that he had a heart attack at the age of 30. And I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, this brother, you know, he was in very good shape. You know, mashallah, he wasn't overweight, he wasn't obese. Regularly, we'd see him walking in the university. And you wouldn't assume that this would be the type of brother that would have a heart attack and pass away. And since then, you know, my mind has been spinning, subhanAllah, that this could have been any one of us. And just by a show of hands, how many people over here are above 30 years old, 30 and older? The vast majority of us over here, actually, you know, maybe about half and half, are above 30. You know, this could have been any of us, subhanAllah. And since then, I've been thinking, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sends death as a reminder. And sometimes, you become heedless of this. You know, there's this famous quote, that why does everyone love life but hate death? And death says that because you are a beautiful lie and I am the ugly truth. And that is the reality of it, my dear brothers and sisters. That when it comes to death, we like to be like ostriches. You know, when an ostrich is being attacked, it puts its head in the sand and thinks that the problem is going to go away. But the reality is death is going to come to any one of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that death will come to you even if you are in the most fortified of fortresses, above in the skies. If you think you can escape death, it can never happen. Because it is a reality for each and every one of us. And it is something we need to prepare for. To add to that, nighttime comes and I'm still having these thoughts and reflections. And one of the great scholars from India, he was the head of 
uh, Jamaat Islami over there by the name of Sheikh Abdul Haq Al Ansari, Rahimahullah Taala. He translated a lot of Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah's works, and you know works that personally benefited me as I was growing up. I used to read his things. You know, to lose a great scholar like him, that was another great uh, atrocity. This morning at around 8 a.m., I get another text message. A brother that I grew up playing baseball with, his mother, rahimahullah, passed away today. And then to add to it, on my way over here, um, you know, I make a rule upon myself, I have to speak to my parents at least once every three days. And three days were passing, so I thought, you know, if I don't call my mother right now, I'm not going to get a chance to speak to her. So on my way here, I call her up, and I ask her, you know, how's everything, what's going on? And she starts telling me about her doctor's appointments and, you know, things that are going to happen. And she says, you know, in the vein, if I pass away, I want you to make sure that you come and wash my body. And I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, you know, why is this whole week just filled with reminders about death? And I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, maybe this is what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala wants me to speak about this week. So I wanted to share the beginning of our halaqa talking about death and how it is an ultimate reality. And that no matter how young you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter how good your health is, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for you to die, you will die. So we need to be prepared for death. And I want to share some basic tips and pointers with you in terms of how to be prepared for death be the light ta'ala. The first thing that we're commanded with is that we should leave a wasiyah for our family. So as we know, when we pass away, our wealth is automatically divided according to the sharia. We don't have a choice in terms of how it is divided. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed one third of our wealth in terms of we can divide it in terms of any way that we please. So that one third of your wealth, you can do with it as you please. The first thing that should happen from it is that your loans need to be paid off from that wealth. It is not your family's problem that they pay for your debts, so your, well, your loans should be paid off from that. Secondly, if you want to give money to any one of your friends or relatives that is not already inheriting, so meaning your parents are not included in this, your sisters and brothers are not included in this, your children are not included in this, other than them, if you'd like to give some money to them when they pass away, it's taken away from this one third. Think about the charity that you want to leave behind. Perhaps you know right now you can't give charity, but when you pass away, you know, you may have some money left over. Leave a portion aside for some charity that even after you pass away, this charity is given out. So you have to give, you have to live, leave what we call a wasiya or in English, a will. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, that not, do not let three days pass by except that you have updated your will. Meaning that you have updated your debts, the charity that you want to give, people that owe you money and you know, other expenses like that, make sure it is mentioned. You also want to prepare for that for those of you who are married and have children, how are your family and children going to be taken care of after that? You know, the bank accounts that you have right now, have you prepared a document saying that this money is to be divided Islamically? Because if you don't do that, the government naturally takes up to half of it. So if you have, let's just say, something like $20,000, the government can take up to half of that, up to $10,000, if they will, if you do not leave a will. So you have to make sure you leave a will and you know, leave guidelines in terms of who should pray your janazah, who should wash your body. If you have you know, any money that's hidden somewhere, where it's hidden so your family will have access to it. These are all things you want to mention, bi'idhillahi ta'ala. A second thing you want to prepare for, is in terms of the reward that you can still incur even after you pass away. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us that when a person passes away, three things follow him to his grave. His family follows him, his wealth follows him, and his actions and deeds follow him. Two of them return and one of them remain. His family and his wealth, they go back to where they belong. But it is his deeds that are going to remain with him, and it is his deeds that he will be judged upon. In another hadith, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, tells us that there are three things that will benefit a dead person. There are three things that will benefit a dead person after he passes away. The first of them is a sadaqa jariyah. A sadaqa jariyah, and I'll come to explain what that is. The second of them is a knowledge that he has left behind that the people benefit from. So whether you've written an article, whether you've given a lecture, maybe one day you just gave a reminder and someone implemented it, then as long as they continue to implement it and teach it to others, you will continue to benefit from it. And this is one of the greatest things that you can do. That right now you may think, who are you to leave knowledge behind? But I remind you, my dear brothers and sisters, that anyone can leave knowledge behind. It's about what you know. 
So if you know how to recite Surah Fatiha, teach it to one individual. And make it in the manner that they have to teach it to one individual as well. So at least after you pass away, this will continue to benefit you with Allah Ta'ala. Then the third and last thing the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions is a righteous child that will make dua for you. A righteous child that will make dua for you. And this is the importance of giving tarbiyah to our children in terms of knowing who Allah is, in terms of knowing about the Akhirah, and in terms of the importance of making dua. Knowing that your parents brought you into this world, they're the most deserving people of your good deeds. And this is, you know, a bit of a tangent, but I want you to look at the understanding of Abdullah ibn Mubarak radiallahu anhu. Abdullah ibn Mubarak radiallahu anhu, he said, if I was to ever backbite anyone, I would backbite my parents. They asked him, why? You know, why would you do this, O Abu Abdul Rahman? And he said, because my parents are most deserving of my good deeds. And obviously, Abdullah ibn Mubarak radiallahu anhu, he will never backbite. But he's given an example over here, that the people most deserving of your good deeds are your parents. So make sure that you leave a portion of good deeds for them as, a, as well. A thought to think about. Now, in terms of the Sadaqa Jariyah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions in another hadith, Seven particular things, seven particular things, and I did a, a lecture on this some time back that you can look up on YouTube, inshallah. But we'll go through them quickly. Seven particular things that will continue to benefit a person after they pass away. The first of them is that the individual uh, teaches some knowledge, so we've discussed that already. The second of them is that he makes a pathway for water to become facilitated for the people. So now this is not so much an issue in Canada because water comes throughout our taps over here. But if you were to look back home in our native countries, whether it be in Africa, whether it be in the subcontinent, whether it be in East Asia, wherever it may be, water is not that easily accessible. So people need water irrigation. They need to facilitate pathways of water to come in. So if you can do that, ta'ala, that will be a sadaqah jariya for you. The third thing the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions is the building of a well. The building of a well. So if you can build a well for people, even after you pass away, and when people drink from it, it will be a sadaqah jariyah for you. And I want to briefly talk about the well over here. People don't understand the significance of this. Our predecessors, rahimahumullah, they gave a lot of importance to building a well. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah, speaking about wells, he said, anyone who has an illness, let him build a well for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the one who grants life to the people, Will, the, will be the one that grants life to you. Meaning that when you build a well for people, you're building life for them. Meaning that you're granting them life through drinking water, through cooking, through taking care of their animals, through taking care of their plants. So you're granting them life. And when you grant life to the people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant life to you. So you mentioned this particular, that anyone has a long-term ailment, a long-term sickness, let him build a well for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he will uh, you know, take care of that. This was, all the this was also one of the advices of one of the other predecessors. That for people who are unable to have children, it was recommended for them that they would build a well, that they grant life to the people, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant life through them as well. So the third thing that is mentioned is the building of a well. The fourth thing that is mentioned is the planting of a tree. The planting of a tree. And you know that trees are multifaceted. Trees are used for shade. Trees are used for wood. Trees are used for fruit. Trees are used as barriers. You know, trees are used for many things. So the planting of a tree will be a sadaqah jariyah for you as well. The fifth thing the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions is that he builds a masjid. He builds a masjid. So as you know, the building of the of masajid, people come to pray here, people come to learn, people come to you know, make dua, people come just to have their walimas and their aqiqas. It is a place of gathering the people. It will continue to benefit you as well. Number six, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions is that he gives a mushaf, he gives a Qur'an as a gift. He gives a Qur'an as a gift. And this is one of the greatest gifts that you can give subhanahu You know, back then it was difficult because the Qur'ans weren't printed. They were things that people wrote out on their hands, on shoulders, on bones, on, you know, scraps of leather. That is how the Qur'an would be passed on. But in our day and age, giving a Qur'an as a gift, making sure that people read it, you know, ta'ala is a great source of ajr. And this is something, just as a reminder to myself and to you, that I want you to think about since Ramadan, where is your Qur'an? Where is your Qur'an? Like right now, if I was to ask everyone that has a cell phone, where is your cell phone? You would know where it is. Either it's with you, it's at home, it's in the car, you know where it is. But where is your Qur'an? And you'll notice that the biggest problem over here is that people do not even have a personal copy of the Qur'an anymore. 
that you know we'll come to the masjid to read Quran. We'll have one Quran for the family. But where is your personal Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated for you, carry it in your bags, have it on your phones, wherever it is, you should know where it is, even more than where you know where your phone is. Because your phone is a connection to the world, your Quran is your connection to Allah, and a connection to your Akhirah. And I ask you, which one is more important? So you should know where your Quran is. The last and the seventh point, my dear brothers and sisters, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, is that righteous child that a person leaves behind to make dua for him. Now the last thing I want to talk about in terms of death is the responsibility of the community in taking care of the families of the deceased. That you know in our community people are going to pass away. And the one that passes away should not feel you know, any sorrow or anxiety as he's passing away in terms of who's going to take care of their families. It is the responsibility of the community to take care of the, the family of the deceased whether it be by providing them money, whether it be by providing them food, whether it be by providing them shelter, just to make sure that people are taken care of. And I'll tell you why. You can do this for a very, very selfish reason. The sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the way that you treat people, it is the way that people will treat you. And this has been proven throughout history, that the way you treat people is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will treat you. So when you take care of the families of the deceased, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send someone to take care of your family as well when you pass away. So if you were to do it for no other reason than that, that your family is taken care of, let that be the reason. So if you know of someone that has passed away and they have left their families behind, do your utmost to take care of them. Whatever you can do to help out, make sure you do it. Just so that, bi ta'ala, if you were to pass away, there's someone to take care of your family as well. Now to proceed with our tafsir of Surah Al-Nas. Now if you were to look at Surah Al-Nas, we mentioned last week that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent these two surahs down together. And who can remind me what the reason of revelation was? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send these two surahs down together? What had happened that caused the revelation of these two surahs? Who can remind me? Go ahead. Magic was done upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ahsan, Magic was done upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to teach the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the people how to defend themselves against magic. And last week we mentioned two virtues of Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas. Who can remind you what those two virtues are? What were the two virtues of Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas? We have like about 150 people here. Someone must remember something. Two virtues. Go ahead. Remind me of one of them. I'll give you a hint. Think about oh. night time and think about Aisha radiallahu anha. Go ahead. Like the virtues is if you read that at the night and like blow on your hands and go through your whole body, it will like give you protection for the whole night. Ahsan, Jazakallah khair. So it was how frequently the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to recite these surahs. Qul hullahu ahad, qul a'udhu bar bin falaq, and qul a'udhu bar bin nas. So not only would the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recite them after salah, but the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would recite them before he would go to bed. He would read them, blow on his hands, and then wipe over his body, and then wipe over his bodies. So one of the first virtues is how frequently the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to recite these. What was the second virtue we mentioned? Go ahead. Uh, it was how the Prophet sallallahu told the Sahaba that these two surahs had never been revealed to any other nation. Ahsan, jazakallah khair that the previous nations were not given anything to ward off the evil eye and to ward off magic. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down these particular surahs as a blessing and as a gift to this ummah to ward off these things. As a blessing and as a gift to this ummah to ward off these things. So now let us get into Surah Al-Nas. Let us get into Surah Al-Nas. So Surah Al-Nas, it begins with, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Say, I seek refuge with Allah, the Lord of mankind. Malikin Nas, the king of mankind. Ilahin Nas, the one who is worshipped or the god of mankind. We're going to take these three verses together because they're all tied in together. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ Nas, Say, I seek refuge in Allah, the Lord of all of mankind. So now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this surah again by reminding, by reminding the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the importance of seeking spiritual refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So like we learned last week, an isti'ana is physical, physical help. Isti'ada, the saying of a'udhu, is a spiritual help. So that spiritual help is sought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions that the Lord of all of mankind. Now why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention the Lord of all of mankind? Because what ends up happening is that when one thinks about evil, when one thinks about fear, they become enslaved to that fear. They become enslaved to that concept of being overpowered. And that is why you think, you know, people who are overwhelmed by magic or overwhelmed by jinn, they so easily fall into innovation, they so easily fall into shirk because they want to do anything to get out of that predicament. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He starts off by saying, the Lord of all of mankind for a particular reason. And that is that that thing that you are afraid of, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even the Lord of that thing as well as being your Lord. So more powerful than that thing that you are afraid of is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not be afraid of that thing. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the Lord of all of mankind. Now the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it encompasses two or three main concepts. So when you talk about Lord, when you talk about a Rabb in the Arabic language, it means the Lord is someone that creates. The Lord is someone that creates. He is someone that sustains. So meaning that not only does he bring it into life, but he maintains it as well. And then the third thing is the sign of a true Lord is that it has unconditional behavior. Meaning that everything is subjugated to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I remember, you know, I was reading a, like a Christian website, if you want to call it that, yesterday. And it was talking about, you know, the sun and how people should be grateful or giving like the sun. So this Christian preacher is talking about, you know, look at the sun. Each morning it rises and it gives to the earth and the earth doesn't even say thank you and doesn't give anything back to the sun. We should be like the sun. Now I'm thinking like this, you know, the sun has no feelings, it has no emotions. It does not care whether, you know, it gives or takes. It is the creation of Allah that was created to act like this. So while it sounds like such a nice example, but the more you think about it, the how futile this example is. Because this is like, you know, giving and taking, having emotion is a human characteristic. It is a human characteristic. So now the reason why I mention this is that when we talk about subjugation to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want you to think about the distance that the earth travels around the sun and the distance that the moon rotates. Did the moon, ever, sorry, the, the sun rotates. Does it ever take a day off? No, it doesn't. Does it ever decide, you know, one day I'm not going to come out? No, it doesn't. It is subjugated by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now similarly, our lives, there are elements and aspects of them that are subjugated purely by the laws of Allah. When you came into this world, did you have a decision, hey, I'm going to leave my mother's stomach today, and I've been here long enough? No, you didn't have that decision. Likewise, when you leave this world, is it, hey, I've had enough of this life, you know, let me move on to the next life? No, it isn't. We are all subjugated by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the sign of a true Rabb. And you will see the next two points are directly related, related to this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, Malikin Nas, the king of all of mankind. So it is a continuation that I seek refuge in the Lord of mankind. I seek refuge in the king of all of mankind. Now why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention king in this verse? The king has two primary roles. One is true ownership of everything. And the true Rabb will have true ownership of everything mean that he will own everything. And that is why when you look, not only in this dunya, but look in the hereafter as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask on one of the very first questions, Anil Malik Anil Dayyan, that I am the king and I am the one that you will be paying your debts to. And where are the people who used to claim to be kings on that day? And he will say, Limanil Mulk Al Yom, that who is the dominion and the kingdom for today? To point out that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the true king. And the second reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions king over here, again, is to show the true obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That on, on that day, when people are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can anyone say to Allah, Oh Allah, you know, I'm tired of standing, I've, I'm sweating, can you please start the day of judgment? Or Oh Allah, give me shade, or Oh Allah, grant me this? No, you can't. Because the ultimate authority on that day is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of that. That no matter how many kings you have, no matter how many rulers that you have, the king of all kings is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ultimate rulership and ultimate obedience is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The third thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, he goes on in the continuing sentence, and I seek refuge 
ilahin nas in the Lord or the object of worship of all of mankind. The object of worship of all of mankind. Now the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this is that once you realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything and sustains everything and that Allah owns everything and everything answers to Allah alone, it necessitates that you realize that it is only one that has all of these characteristics that is worthy of our worship. That is worthy of our worship. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions ilahin nas over here. Because all of these characteristics necessitate that you worship the one that has all these characteristics. Another reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions ilahin nas over here is to show us that the act of isti'ada, the act of saying a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim is an act of worship. The act of saying a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim is an act of worship. So that when you say this statement, you are incurring reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are incurring closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is a reminder that don't think that it's just about purely you benefiting in terms of protection. But rather this is an act of ibadah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. So that is an understanding of the first three verses. So you are seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then in the next set of verses, who are you seeking refuge from? Who are you seeking refuge from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, Min sharr al waswas al khannas. From the evil of al waswas al khannas. So, evil. We talked about evil last week. And how in Islamic philosophy, there's no such thing as something that is absolute and pure evil. That even in the presence of shaitan, there is goodness that comes about in terms of that when we fight off the whispers of a shaitan, it leads us to performing good deeds and getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the concept of evil. We discussed that last week. You can revise that in last week's halaqa. Now we get to al-waswas and al-khannas. Al-waswas is a name for shaitan. And in fact, it is the most common attribute of a shaitan. So this concept or this name of waswas, it comes from the attribute of waswasa, which is to whisper something, which is to whisper something. Now when you whisper something, you use it in a low voice and if you're a really good whisper, if you know how to whisper really well, no one should be able to detect it. So you will stand close to someone, you'll whisper into their ears, and no one around them will be able to hear or know what you whispered. Now I ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, is there anyone that is as good as this as shaitan? That when shaitan whispers to one of us, does the other person know what shaitan whispered to the other individual? Not at all. So this is like his profession. And this is why Ibn al-Qayyim, he mentions that even though this is an attribute of shaitan, it is more like a name or a title for him. So al-waswas is a title or a name for shaitan due to how proficient he is at whispering to others. Due to how proficient he is at whispering to others. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to describe him with something else. Al-Khannas. Al-Khannas is something that disappears. Meaning that it's here one second, and it disappears the next second. And I'm going to bring in uh, a scene from a movie here. For those of you who were born in the 80s or 90s, you may remember this. 2000 and later, you may be too old. How many people remember The Usual Suspects? Anyone remember Usual Suspects? Only a few of you, okay. I remember, you know, in high school, this is one of my favorite movies, just because of this one line. So they have this um, character in the movie. He's a fictional character. They call him Kaiser Soze. Do you guys remember that? Kaiser Soze. So Kaiser Soze, he's being interviewed by the police. He's stuck. There's no way he's getting out of this. And he just keeps on making a story after another, just reading all the pictures that are on the cop's wall. And then he tells the people after that, you know, the greatest trick the devil ever played was making the people believe he didn't exist. So that was the greatest trick of shaitan, that he made people believe that he did not exist. And subhanAllah, you know, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us over here. That just because people can't see shaitan, he's made people believe that he does not exist. And that is what Al-Khannas is. That he is someone that just disappears. You cannot see him, but he's there in terms of its effect. He's there in terms of its effect. And that is what Al-Khannas is. It is the one that disappears. And this is a second attribute for shaitan. It is a second attribute for shaitan that he disappears. So now the question arises, what are the whispers of shaitan and what makes shaitan disappear? What are the whispers of shaitan and what makes shaitan disappear? For those of you who attended my khutbah last week at uh, Edmonton Trail and two weeks ago over here, 
We talked about the traps of shaitan. So shaitan has seven ultimate goals that he wants individuals to achieve. So in terms of you on an individual level, he has seven goals that he wants to achieve. And he's not going to give up until he achieves these seven goals. So that his first and ultimate goal is that you commit shirk or kufr with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His first and ultimate goal is that you as an individual, he wants you to commit shirk and kufr with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he can't get you to do that, he wants you to fall into innovation. If he can't get you to fall into innovation, he wants you to fall into a major sin. If he can't get you to fall into a major sin, he wants you to fall into a minor sin. If he can't get you to fall into a minor sin, he wants you to be wasting your time in something permissible. So, you know, watching the news, reading the news, watching sports, just wasting your time, staying away from productivity. And if he can't get you to be preoccupied with something permissible, he wants you to do the lesser of the two deeds. So someone right now, and you know, no offense if you're watching this at home, you know, someone may think, you know what, I can watch this halakha at home, let me just watch it at home, why do I need to come to the masjid? But coming to the masjid, you miss the, the father of praying in jama'ah. You miss the father of praying in jama'ah. So shaitan got the best of you. You, guys, you get the, the ajr of watching the halakha and benefiting from the halakha, but you miss the ajr of the jama'ah. So that is the sixth step. And the seventh step is that if shaitan can't get you to do any of these things, that is when shaitan unleashes his troops on you. Mean that he will have his troops from the ins and from the jinn, they will gather together and they will find a way to make your life miserable. Slandering you, cursing you, just making things difficult. Just making things difficult for you in general. So these are the seven objectives of shaitan. And that is why you have to realize that, you know, imagine if this was a real war. You know, for those of you who play Call of Duty and all these other games, this is like shaitan's tactical plan. That at each step he's trying to attack you. So you know this is where he's coming from. So now the question arises, now the question arises, what are the tools that shaitan is going to use to get you to fall into these traps? What are the tricks and you know, tools that shaitan is going to use to get you to fall into these traps? And those are generally four. Those are generally four. So there's seven traps that he has, and the tools that he gets to, to do them are four. Number one is that he beautifies sins. He makes sins look so beautiful, subhanAllah. And I want you to think about you know, the marketing ads for the major crimes in this world. Think about, you know, alcohol. They'll get the world's most beautiful women and be like, hey, if you drink, I'm not gonna mention that particular name, we could get sued, but if you drink this brand of alcohol, you know, you'll be with this girl. Think about cigarettes, you know, something that is killing you as you're doing it. You know, if you smoke our cigarette, you'll be floating on the beach under the sun. You know, they beautify it. Where do you think this comes from? It comes from shaitan. And related to this very point, you know, I want you to just look at the history of mankind. Then look at how far we've evolved or de-evolved the way you want to look at it. That, you know, up until, I would say the 1930s, 1940s, if a woman show her ankles, she's considered a prostitute. Like one of the ways you would distinguish a prostitute from a regular woman is that she would show her ankles or the bottom of her legs. And now, you know, subhanAllah, this is a report from like three or four years ago in Montreal. There was like a, a complaint filed by the, the prostitutes that we are unable to get business anymore because we have no way to distinguish ourselves. And they start up a whole different industry, which I'm not going to get into, but they were unable to distinguish themselves. Where did this come from? It came from shaitan. Because shaitan beautified this sin. Shaitan beautified this sin. And there's a, a, a hadith that is very commonly misinterpreted. That when a woman leaves her house, shaitan becomes her companion. So, you know, you'll get the feminist movement think that, you know, uh, Muslim men are saying that women are always accompanied by the devil. Ibn al-Qaim, rahimahullah, he goes on to explain this hadith, that this hadith has nothing to do with the woman whatsoever. It has to do with the man. That when a woman leaves her house, shaitan beautifies this woman to the man. And it becomes a fitna and a temptation. And that is the correct understanding of this hadith, that shaitan beautifies sin. So that is the first tool that he will use. The second tool that shaitan will use is that he will cause doubts in your mind. That the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reported by Abu Hurairah is that shaitan comes to a person in his moment of weakness and he gets him to question things he should not be questioning. So he starts to question who created this? Who created that? And then eventually gets to who created Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And you have to realize that man's intellect, it was created by Allah. And like our bodies in terms of strength, even our intellects, they have limits. So there are certain things that you should not be questioning. So shaitan will cause doubts in your mind. Hey, you know, if the Quran is so true, then why doesn't everybody accept it? You know, things, like retarded things like that. Those are from shaitan. So shaitan comes 
to cause doubts in your mind. So that is the second trick he will use. The third trick that shaitan uses is that he will cause you to forget. If you look at the story of Musa and the young boy in Surah Al-Kahf, what happened over there? Musa he goes on to say that it was shaitan that made me forget. So shaitan will make you forget things, whether related to your dunya or related to your akhirah. If it's productive, if shaitan cannot get you to do something bad, he'll get you to forget. And this is one of the, the tricks that our predecessors taught us, that whenever you forget something of importance, pray two rakas. Because shaitan will come and remind you at that time what that thing of importance was. Because anything to distract you. And that is what shaitan does. And this is like, you know, Allah knows best how authentic the story is. But a man came to Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and he said that, oh Imam, you know, I had this money that I had, but I can't remember where it is. So the Imam, he tells him, go pray two rakas. And the man's like, why? You know, what am I going to achieve by this? He said, just go do it. I promise you, you'll remember where it is. So in the very first rakah, the man's praying, he remembers where it is. He gets so happy, he can't control his salah anymore. So he comes back to the Imam, he said, didn't I tell you you'd find it? And sorry, he's like, how did you know I'd find it? He's like, this is a trick that shaitan has been using for years. That as soon as someone busies themselves in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shaitan will find something to distract him. So if shaitan ever makes you forget something, pray two rakahs and bidhi ta'ala, you will remember what it is. The fourth and last technique or tool that shaitan will use is that he will make you worried about things. So things that happened in the future and grief over the things that happened in the past. This is like one of shaitan's ultimate tools. That you made a mistake in the past, you committed a sin in the past, shaitan will make you feel like you could never be forgiven. Like you will always be a hypocrite, you'll always be someone that is sinful. And this is from shaitan. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you that whenever you repent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins. No matter how many sins you've committed, even if they're like the foam on the sea, even if they're as great as between the heavens and the earth, as long as a person sincerely repents to Allah, Allah will forgive him for the past. And in terms of the future, shaitan makes you worried about how will you achieve these tasks? You know, you don't have the tools to do it. You don't have the tools to be great. You're just a layman. You were created to be a nobody in this dunya. Someone created to be forgotten. And this is from shaitan as well. If you look at the battle of Wahad, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell the Muslims on that day? He tells them, That it is shaitan who makes his close companions fearful. So if you notice that you're fearful of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, know that it is from shaitan. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he goes on to say, that do not fear shaitan, but rather fear me if you're indeed believers. So if your fear is of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, know that you have been deceived by shaitan. That shaitan makes you worry about the future. He makes you think that you're incapable of doing things. But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his help has created you with capability and ability to do whatever you like. Capability and ability to do whatever you like. And just look at the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Without a shadow of a doubt, we know that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most influential person throughout history. He has, there is no prophet that has a bigger gathering than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the Day of Judgment. But look at where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came from. He was born as an orphan. His parents died, his people, the people who took care of him died. He was poor. He was unable to read and write. Yet the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became the most dignified person in history. If we were to plan it, we wouldn't be able to plan it as perfectly. Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala was handling that situation and taking care of it. So any fears you have in your life, whether it be in terms of the profession you want to achieve, you know, a business that you want to start, some type of project that you want to do to benefit the community, do not be overwhelmed by fear and overcome by fear. But put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of it. And that is why in the verses that we recited in Salat al-Maghrib from Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells the Messenger of Allah, do not worry about the plots and plans of the mushrikun, the, the, the polytheists, and the hypocrites. But rather put your trust in Allah, and Allah is sufficient as a trustee. So those are the tools and tactics that shaitan uses. Now how does one go protecting themselves against shaitan? And the reason why this comes into play is because the question arises, what is it that makes shaitan disperse? What is it that makes shaitan run away? So one of the first hadith that we know about shaitan running away is at the giving of the adhan. So when the adhan is given, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that as soon as the Adhan starts to be given, then Shaitan runs away. And as soon as the Adhan stops, then Shaitan comes back to distract the people. Another thing that makes Shaitan going away 
is the saying of A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. That as soon as you remember Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Shaitan flees from that gathering. The saying of the Basmala, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us that the one who says Bismillah before he enters his house and Bismillah before he eats, Shaitan has no place to stay nor no food to eat that night. And then obviously the recitation of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah in particular, Ayatul Kursi inside Surah Al-Baqarah, the last two verses from Surah Al-Baqarah, like we recited in Salat al maghrib all of these verses in particular, they make Shaitan run away. The recitation of their last three quls, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq, and Qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas, they make Shaitan run away. So these are things to remember, to make Shaitan run away. And this is an attribute of Shaitan, that he will disappear, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us how to make him disappear. Then we move on to the last two verses, and with that we'll conclude, and open up the floor for question and answers. Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, that he is the one who whispers inside the chests of men. He is the one who whispers inside the chests of mankind. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention the whispering inside the chest of mankind? It is because the chest is the home of where the heart is. And it is the heart that shaitan tries to affect the most. Because when your heart is weak, when your heart is disattached from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is when shaitan starts winning his battles. So the whispers of shaitan, they start by attacking the heart first. So anything that will make the heart weak, anything that will rust the heart, anything that will bring blackness to the heart, shaitan is trying to do. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the chests of mankind. The last thing in this very last verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, min al jinnati wan nas. That literally it means from mankind, from the jinn and from mankind. But if we were to look at the context of the surah, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to tell us in this story? That are we seeking refuge from the shayateen al ins wal jinn? Meaning that are we seeking refuge in Allah from the shayateen of the human beings and the jinn? Or are we saying, or are we saying, I seek refuge in Allah from the whispers that shaitan prosts? in the chest of mankind and the jinn. So do you guys understand the difference between the two? No? Okay, let's go through it again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the last verse, min al jinnati wan nas, that from the jinn and of mankind. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention this? Meaning what is the goal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to achieve over here? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to tell us that the one who whispers is of two kinds? The shayateen al-ins and the shayateen al-jinn. Is that the first objective? Because there's two possibilities. That is scenario number one. That Allah is telling us that the shayateen are of two types. The shayateen al-ins and the shayateen al-jinn. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us something else. That shaitan has the ability to whisper inside the chests of mankind and the jinn. So these are the two possible scenarios and the two linguistic interpretations of this verse. But one of them is correct and one of them isn't. And the correct one is the first one. That the ones that do the whispering can be from the shayateen al-ins and the shayateen al-jinn. Because we have no proof to show that the shayateen whisper amongst themselves. And linguistically, the term jinn does not come under the word nas. So the word jinn does not come under the word nas. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fi sudurin nas, in the chests of men. But the term nas over here does not accompany the word jinn. That is why Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says that it is the first opinion that is correct. That the one that does the whispering is the shayateen al-ins and jinn. And it is not the second opinion that the one who is whispered to is the ins and the jinn. So I hope you guys understand that. Bidhanahi ta'ala. The last thing I want to mention, and I forgot this when we were doing this in the beginning, is what does the word nas mean? Where does the term nas come from? And there are two predominant opinions in terms of the word nas. Because we start off in the beginning, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ nas. Let's say I seek refuge in the Lord of mankind. We translate it as a mankind in English, but in the Arabic language, what does it mean? There are two predominant opinions that Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentions in terms of nas. He says that the first opinion is that the word nas comes from something that is seen. The word nas is something that is seen as opposed to the word jinn, which is something which is hidden. So the first opinion is that nas is something that is seen as opposed to the word jinn, which is something which is hidden. 
Then the second thing that Ibn Al-Tayy mentions is that the word nas comes from that which moves physically and, inter and internally. So what does that mean exactly? If you were to look at an animal, does it move physically? Yes, it does. But does it move internally? What does that mean? When Ibn, uh, when Ibn al Taymiyyah talks about internal movement over here, I know what you're going to say. But does that look at? He's talking about the movement of the heart in terms of the heart getting closer to Allah and further from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So al harikatul batina. That is what he's referring to. So the, the, the nas is referring to that anyone that can physically and spiritually get closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So the animals and the plants, they only have the physical element, whereas it is the human being and the jinn that have the spiritual element. So the two most predominant opinions about the word nas is number one, it is something that is seen, and number two, it is something that has a, a physical and a spiritual movement. And with that, we'll conclude. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We'll open the floor for five questions. And then I have two announcements during my time. Go ahead. Okay, so you're saying about the preparing of death. Yes. Um, you said to make a, a pathway for water. Does the water have to be fresh water? Or just water that's usable. So people can drink from it and benefit from it. So it shouldn't be water that's polluted or, or you know, tainted or anything like that. Allah knows best. Number two. Uh, in terms of the well that uh, we uh, make for the uh, benefit of our for us or our parents. Yes. So there should be something uh, that needs to be recited uh, when we make it. Or no, just whenever. I, I mean, either you can dig the well yourself if you have the ability to do that, or when you make or when you give the money for the well, you make the intention that this is for myself or for my family or whoever you're doing it for. You only have to make the intention. You don't have to say anything. Okay. Allah knows best. Who is number three? I think you were number three. Go ahead. Um, they say shaitan is the best for spirit. Um, like. Like, like, um, it, can you like teach uh, like other bad people? Like last halakha, you said that like people like they can like turn into like shaitan. They can yes. like Allah like they keep good for stuff. Like so, can you teach like people like uh, nas to like um like be whispers like him? I mean, not to that degree. Human yeah, beings like, aren't able to whisper like shaitan. Like there's no, as far as I know, there's no concept. Islamically, as telepathic communication, that I think something and all of a sudden you start thinking and you start doing it. Whereas, from a human perspective, if I want you to do something bad, I'll either tell it to you or I'll show you how to do it. And that is how a person becomes from the shayateen al ints, that he tells people to do evil deeds or he shows them how to do evil deeds. That is when a person becomes from the shayateen al ints. Allah knows best. Number four. You have tried to say that the uh, difference between these. Uh Shaitan, who is the whisper man uh, and jinn and son, right? Yes. So last two words, uh, last verse is say that from the jinn and the insan means the, the Shaitan can only play with these two kinds. And the human are affected by these two things Correct. only. Yes. So that's the reason Allah SWT say those people are involved with the like Jin and Nisan. Yes. Like, from yes, because they are the ones that have the ability to cause doubts and to do the plots of Shaitan. Meaning that the animals, they are they're not affected by Shaitan because there's no concept of muhasibah. Meaning that they'll not be judged by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the hereafter. Whereas the human beings will. So Shaitan will come and whisper to the ins and the jinn. That is what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling us in that verse. Now I know you guys have a lot of questions, but I have a general rule that we only do five questions. So our brother over here has the last question. All other questions, you can come to me after the class, and I make the announcements, inshallah. Go ahead. You said that there is shayatin ins and shayatin jinn. Yes. Like when we make istiada from shayatin jinn, can we make istiada from shayatin ins? Yeah, it's the same thing. So as soon as you say, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim this is from you know al istiada min ash-shaytin al ins and shayatin al jinn. So it's the same thing. So. There are, I mean, there's two concepts that we misunderstand. There's the person that becomes possessed by shaitan, and then he calls the people to evil. So the example of this is that if you look in, uh, in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, in the early days of Mecca, the Quraysh, they used to gather in this place called Dar al-Nadwa. Do you guys remember Dar al-Nadwa? We've studied seerah. So in Dar al-Nadwa, the Quraysh used to gather together, and they were coming up with a plan in terms of what they could do with the Messenger of Allah. So... This individual, he walks in, a very old man, no one knows who he is, but since he's old, they respect him.
So he's sitting in the middle of the gathering, and someone mentions, you know what, we'll start spreading rumors about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this man, he says, you know what, that's not a good opinion. Another individual says, you know what, we'll start harming the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says, you know what, that is not a good opinion. And this continues happening until they come to the conclusion that, you know what, let us kill the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then this man says, you know what, that is the best opinion. That is what you guys should do. So this person, he was possessed by shaitan. So shaitan physically took over his body and you know, that's what he did. So this is one concept. Another concept is that there are naturally people who don't need to be possessed by shaitan to be evil. That they're just, you know, due to bad tarbiyah, due to not controlling their nafs, they're bad, bad people. You know, that's just the na nature of things. So when you say, you know, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, you're seeking refuge from the first category. People who are possessed by shaitan and they whisper to do, uh, the, to do bad things. In terms of the second category, if you know people who do bad things, it is upon you to distance yourself from them. That don't be in their company. So that, that's the difference between the two. I hope that helps, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika shalwa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirullah wa tubu ilayk. Two announcements, bin Allah ta'ala. Announcement number one is that we have the Salihat conference this week. So for those of you with families, please make sure you attend. It's Friday night, it's for the whole families. And then Saturday is for the sisters only. For more details, they can check the ISC website. Uh, the second announcement is in terms of the halaqa. Next week, the halaqa will start at 7.30. And we want to keep it like that till the end. Because there's brothers who attend a different halaqa at Edmonton Trail, the Tajweed halaqa. And they will complain that, you know, we can't come and attend. So we're going to try to accommodate them. So every week from now on, this halaqa will start on Wednesday nights at 7.30. And again, I remind you, please make sure you sign up for the emailing list. Because if there's ever like an emergency cancellation or an emergency change of location, or I need you guys to bring something or watch something before you come, sign up to the emailing list so you'll have that information as well. You do that by going to iisc.ca and on the right hand side, I believe, you can sign up for the emailing list, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Have a great week. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.